Another thing we can talk about is, uh, I call it avoiding Thai pollution. So uh, there is a site called Stock Tweets where stock traders are tweeting about which stocks they're buying and selling. Um, and when you ask, for example, on, on Apple, you're going to get about 1600 lines of a JSON document uh, with the message uh, and inside the message, uh, they're saying that, that what are other symbols? So someone said, uh, I bought Apple and also Nvidia and also uh, IBM. So the symbols are going to be the Apple one and then and Nvidia maybe and the IBM in the symbols. And I want to post that JSON message. And if you try to mimic the whole JSON message in Struts, you're going to have a lot of types. They're going to be a type message and a type symbol, and there are many, many other things inside. But here you can take the advantage that um, encoding JSON ignores what it doesn't know and say, I just need to model part of that, and I'm not going to model anything. And another thing you can do is you can actually um, use anonymous structure. So here's the start. We just say this is the URL template, and we are doing an HTTP request to get the JSON. And now we get to the interesting part about decoding. So this is everything I need to decode the data that is interesting to me. I'm using a reply struct, which is an anonymous structure. So I don't add another type for message, another type for symbols, another type for symbol, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't have this type pollution of defining a lot, a lot of types just to pass on JSON. I can use it inside the function. It's not even visible outside. And I'm naming the names in ways that are matching the, uh, the JSON document. So I don't even need the, the field tags to, to say what I need. Right, and then I just can go decode on the reply. And that's it. way less code than um, what we have uh, there. And then finally, I can do some calculations. So what I'm doing is uh, I'm creating the related symbols and counting how many times each symbol was uh, shown, right? And if I'm going to run that, you see that uh, all of these were mentioned next to Apple, probably this one the most, uh, SPY, that's the uh, S&P. Uh, but also, uh, and this is the Dow Jones, the QPQ. But all the rest of them, Google, and uh, I don't know what the rest of them are. NVIDIA, yeah. <laughs> all right. So really uh, use the fact that encoding JSON uh, ignores unknown field, unknown members in, in the JSON, and use anonymous structures. And then when you're passing things, this is really small and really tight and really uh, working nicely. You don't have to define a lot of things again and again. Custom civilization. So we talked about that, that if you have a struct like this, uh, so I'm going to define something which is a value, has a unit and then an amount. And the unit can be either a meter or an Hey, meter in inches. Why not centimeters in inches? I don't know, but let's let's go with that. Uh, uh, and if I'm going just to run it, so right, I'm creating a new encoder to the standard output, and I'm encoding the value. Uh, if I'm going to run it, this is going to look like this, right? The unit, and you see it's in capital U. And then uh, there is the amount, which is uh, 2.1, and this is uh, what we get. But Product comes in and says, no, 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 no. We want it like this in the JSON doc. You want it to look different than what you need. Uh, and to do that, we have two interfaces that we can implement. So inside encoding the, the JSON, there are two interfaces that are defined. One is called Marshaller, and this is Marshall JSON, which you should return a byte slice and a possible error. And then you can also say, coming from a, main, a JSON document, I want to handle how it is being serialized to my type. So you can define an unmarshaller interface, which gets a byte slice. Now, this is the raw JSON data. And if it succeeds, if it doesn't succeed, it returns. Here's the marshalling, right? So two steps. 
to do marshalling, always. Step one, convert your type to a type that is known to encoding.json. In this case, I'm converting it to a string. So I'm using sprintf and I'm doing %f, %s. So this is going to be uh, the amount and then the unit, 2.1 meter. Second step is use json.marshall to actually convert this data, this type, into JSON. Don't try to construct the JSON manually. There's a lot of edge cases there. Unless you have a really, really good reason for performance, don't do that. Just convert it to a type, type that is known to JSON and use Marshall. That's it. it will be much simpler and you'll avoid a lot of errors. So you convert that. On the other side of things, we have unmarshaled JSON. Now I want to point something out. You see, this is the receiver V, and this is a value receiver, right? I'm passing in a value. But when you do unmarshaling, we always work with pointer receivers because we just get data and return an error. We're not returning a new value. So we have an existing value and we need to mutate this one. So every time you work with unmarshalling, you always work with pointers, pointer receivers. And when we saw the, um, the way that unmarshal works as well, a few slides back, right? We pass in a pointer. So every time we talk about unmarshalling or decoding, always, always working with pointers. Okay, so when I'm doing an unmarshalling, um, I need to check. So I'm checking that there's a minimal length for the data. And then I'm uh, creating a bytes.new reader. And I'm using data from one to minus one because JSON string is coming surrounded by quotes. So I'm moving the quotes. So now it's going to be only the 2.1 meter without these calls inside. And now I'm defining two variables, which are the float 64 for the amount and the, the unit for the unit. And I'm using fscanf. And you can solve it with various other things, but this is my way of doing that. You can uh, break it. You can use regular expressions. You can really do it in many, many ways. I found this one to be pretty easy and pretty understandable. Now, note that I'm not working on V directly, right? V itself has already an amount, uh, if you see here on, on these two lines, an amount and a unit. But I'm not doing that. I'm working on two isolated variables because I don't want that maybe the first one succeeded and the second one failed, and then V has some kind of uh, bad state. So I prefer to do the conversion in isolation, and only if it succeeds, then I'm actually assigning it and returning it, right? So F scan F returns two things, returns how many elements it managed to do and if there was an error. So in our case, I do not really care about how many elements it considered, I just care about the errors, right? So do yourself a favor, do the move from a string to the actual values, so on the side, not on V, and then only if it uh, manages to do that, this is going to work well, and the compiler is usually smart enough to, to optimize it. So this is marshalling and unmarshalling. Most of the time, uh, custom marshalling is a sign that you are working at the API layer or at the data storage layer. But these types are usually shouldn't go there. If you find yourself that you're doing really sophisticated marshalling and unmarshalling, there's something probably wrong in the way that you're moving between uh, these layers of, uh, of your code. Uh, I don't write a lot of custom marshalling out much. Pretty, pretty rare. Uh, the question, in the case where the user can set the same value as the default value, what is the best way to preserve whether the field was set by the user or the default? The only way you can do that is by using a map from string to any, and then you can know which fields are being sent and not. And uh, by the way, there's some civilization formats, for example, protocol buffers, they don't even allow you to know that work with protocol buffers, you have no idea what was sent over the wall. If you use map from string to interface to, to any, you can actually know. 